this presentation. Uh, my name is Michael Cho. Uh, this is my master project presentation, and my advisors are Professor Lee and Professor King. And today I'm going to talk about uh, localized growth of multi-wall carbon nanotubes. So the agenda today, I'm going to touch upon uh, some background on carbon nanotubes um, and I'll just, uh, nail down on our localized growth CNT that our group has uh, pioneered. And we'll talk about the electrical properties that uh, some of the IV characteristics that we can measure with our system. And uh, we'll go on to talk about the pressure sensing capability and also our attempts to make a CNT based uh, electrical probe and finally conclude my presentation. So, what is CNT? I think most of you already know. Uh, it's, we can think of it as a roll up uh, graphite sheet. Uh, and depending how you roll it up or the orientation, or they would like to call it chirality. Uh, you can have different, um, different, very different characteristics. Namely, when you have a zigzag, um, uh, this kind of uh, uh, orientation, chirality, you get a semiconducting, and over here you get a metallic uh, uh, characteristics. Uh, we can also think of carbon nanotube in two ways. Uh, there are this multi-wall carbon nanotube, as you can see here. There are uh, di different concentric layers, and here there's an TM TM image of a bundle of single-wall carbon nanotube. So why so much interest in CNT? Uh, because they have very fascinating properties. Um, for metallic CNT, they have very, very high current capacity. Uh, the highest, I guess, uh, uh, well, typically the, the, the agreed upon value is around 10 to the power of 9 um, uh, ampere per, per cm square, uh, as opposed to copper, which is probably one of the most uh, conducting metal. It's only 10 to the power of 5. So you see a 10 to, uh, 10, almost 10,000 increase. Uh, so there are researchers have been trying to use uh, explore carbon nanotube as an interconnect in uh, normal circuitry. Uh, in terms of semiconducting, the band gap is act uh, they actually depend on uh, diameter and the chirality. So uh, the band gap is actually uh, inversely proportional to the diameter. So this presents a an opportunity as well as a, as a big challenge actually. So if we can uh, have a very good control over the way we fabricate this CNT such that we get persistent characteristics. Uh, we can actually fine tune the semiconducting uh, characteristics of the CNT to make uh, the device that we want. Um, uh, so carbon nanotube, uh, in, for, for very pure carbon nanotube, uh, they are all C uh, sp2 bonds, which means that they are very strong bond uh, compared to diamond. Uh, so they, they actually are one of the, probably one of the strongest material found right now. Uh, they have very high Young's modulus and strength. And if you modulate by density, it's actually 19 and 50 times, uh, respectively, that of steel. So you can imagine a macro scale use of carbon nanotube. Uh, there could be a lot of use because of these um, uh, properties. Uh, they also very thermal. Uh, have, they also have very high thermal conduct, uh, conduction. Um, the measured value is, is around 3,000 watt per uh, meter kelvin. Although um, the theoretical value should go as high as 6,000. So there are also have been some uh, investigation as to using this in uh, to cool down chips. So uh, some of the exciting things that uh, that excites me when you know when I see these pictures. Um, so this company, Ecos, they try to use a, uh, a matrix of polymer with carbon nanotube to make a uh, conductive transparent uh, film. So potentially to replace ITO. Um, this is something that uh, what the the researchers of this group they try to use it in factory for for mat mattress actually. So they, they, according to them, it has very high recovery rate, bounce around, very uh, very strong strength. Um, this is a uh, carbon nanotube based uh, RAM device, not prototype device. So the some memory device. This is a uh, prototype uh, by uh, Samsung. Uh, this is actually the display that uses a carbon nanotube as electron emitters at the back. So the function, uh, the concept is the same as your plasma TV, except that they are using carbon nanotubes. Uh, the people have also tried to explore CNT in bio application. So here you see this picture. Uh, this uh, this work done by Hunter Dice Group. They select, they functionalize the surface of carbon nanotubes such that they, um, the carbon nanotubes selectively uh, attach to cancer cells. And uh, upon IR, IR radiation, uh, the carbon nanotubes heats up and in turn kill the cancer cells. Uh, this is a work by Professor Setoscope. They uh, they have a carbon nanotubes as an anchor and then uh, uh, an island silicon island here. When they apply AC across, this this thing keeps spinning around, so you have a nano motor. Um, so figure G is probably the one that gets me. Uh, I think has the highest potential right now. Uh, it's the really the first macro scale use of carbon nanotube that I've seen. So you can see here that uh, they grow carbon nanotubes on a substrate. This this whole thing, this black powder, uh, just a lot of carbon nanotubes. 
and they have invented a way to spin up carbon nanotubes at a very fast rate, at 37 meters per minute. So, and these are uh, these are very strong. This 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 is basically a sheet of a lot of carbon nanotube, and this is stronger than steel. This is conductive, and this is transparent. So, there are, there could be a lot of use of something like this. And how do we uh, typically make carbon nanotubes? Uh, uh, arc synthesis was the first process uh, when Li Jima first dis dis discovered carbon nanotubes with this process. Uh, basically, you with the electric discharge will give you the uh, sufficient energy to get the reaction going to form carbon nanotubes on the on the on the coal uh, graphite cathode. Uh, laser ablation is another method. Uh, basically, you put your put the graphite target in a in a furnace uh, and subject it to uh, uh, at least around 1,000 uh, degrees Celsius. And typically, this graphite target are uh, mixed in with catalyst as well. And instead of uh, using an electric discharge, you use a laser to create the energy. And and uh, resulting can a carbon nanotube will be deposited on the coal collector. Uh, CVD is something that has been explored uh, a lot more recently. Uh, it's actually very simple. What you did is what you do is you have a your substrate and you, you put down a catalyst on top of it. And uh, instead of having a solid solid source for your carbon, you use a precursor gas, and you just let nature do its work, and you see carbon nanotubes growing up uh, on your substrate. So these are ICM images of these uh, the various methods that are used. Uh, as you can see here, arc synthesis and laser ablation, uh, your your end product uh, are actually all up, up bundled up and entangled. So this is a, this is quite a problem because you need a pretty elaborate post treatment process. And also you have um, with arc synthesis the yield is not very good. You have a lot of other forms of carbons such as fullerenes. Uh, if you look at C these two uh, figures are for CVD. So CVD, the, the bottom is at this is the substrate with the catalyst, right? So uh, if you can engineer your 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 growth uh, conditions well, you can have a very high density of growth for carbon nanotubes, and you end up getting very aligned growth because of Van forces. Uh, they are going just going to grow up straight, and if you if you zoom up, you actually get something like this. So these are all inside carbon nanotubes. Um, so in order for us to make uh, useful devices out of carbon nanotube, you also need some alignment. So people are explore using uh, gas flow uh, as a means. Uh, they, people are also explore PCVD. So you can see here that with the normal thermal CVD, uh, it's kind of curly. But once they start using PCVD, it's uh, very, uh, it's, it's, it's much more directional. So actually, they're, what they're using is actually an electric field that's caused by the shift uh, uh, voltage. So uh, this group actually used just directly use an electric field, and you can see here that the connections are very straight. And uh, Professor Saddle and have also tried to use fluidic flow. Um, so you have a solution of suspended carbon nanotubes and split it, and the carbon nanotubes will be aligned in the fluidic direction. So despite all these advancements in fabrication, uh, there are still a lot of challenges. Uh, so namely, entanglement is still a problem, like I mentioned before, at least for uh, laser ablation and, uh, and arc synthesis. Um, but more importantly, the position of CNT devices in a parallel manner is still lacking. So even though we can make CNT-based transistors that, that have performance that are almost as good as silicon-based ones, uh, the, you, we, we, we don't have the equivalent of photolithography. So uh, that, that's mainly the, the main bottleneck that I, I personally see that's uh, stopping uh, CNT from being used in our large scale. Um, and also, most of the fabrication technique uh, involves very high temperature. So if you want to have CNT device together with some kind of uh, silicon-based transistors or circuitry, uh, you're out of luck. Uh, and finally, the repeatable control growth is still a problem. Um, like I said before, um, uh, every carbon nanotube that you grow might be very different. They might be metallic or semiconducting. So uh, this is one of the things that, that is stopping it from being used as a useful electrical device right now. So what our group proposed is uh, a localized growth uh, of CNT. Uh, uh, I think, it's, in my opinion, it's just a variant of CVD. So instead of subjecting the whole sample uh, to high, very high temperature in the furnace, we provide a heat source with a uh, mouse heater. So, and I'd like to give credit to uh, our PhD student uh, who, who left us already, uh, Dane Christensen. So his idea is use the mouse heater, provide a heat source, and we uh, evaporate the catalyst on top of the heater. And sure enough, uh, uh, the, you can see the carbon is growing up. So, um, so first of all, you, you get around that. I mean, there's no entanglement now. Uh, and that is sort of automatic positioning in a, in a sense that your carbon nanotubes ends up where your, you design your heaters to be. So you, you sort of have a positioning uh, control. And so it's localized heating, so potentially you can have other circuitry on the same chip. 
And also, as I'll talk about later, uh, we, we do achieve some kind of control group. Um, so the basic setup is we start up with an SOI wafer. Uh, we have map seeder on the SOI wafer, and this map seeder are uh, highly dosed uh, heat up silicate. And uh, the, the width of the heaters are typically around 5 micron, and the usual uh, resistance of the heaters are around 350 ohms, uh, with quite a bit of variation across chips. So this is a uh, picture, uh, the dice is here, and then we have a package, and we put a package in this. Uh, this is the chamber that we usually carry out our test. Uh, this is a very simple electrical uh, schematic. So this is a growth structure, and we apply a V1 voltage across it to heat it up, and we apply a V2, and we basically use V2 to create a localized electric field for alignment of the carbon nanotubes during, during the growth. And on the other side, the secondary structure is uh, actually tied to the ground via a uh, pretty high resistor. Uh, it's our, typically, we use around 18 mega ohms and above. So uh, we use such a high resistance because we don't want the carbon to to, uh, to sort of uh, burn out once upon connection. And another good thing about having a resistor here is that we can hook up a, a four meter here, which in a sense gives us a real time uh, monitoring of the growth process. So the conditions that we typically use, uh, we use around 250 tall. Uh, the temperature I say here is more than 850 degrees Celsius. Uh, although um, I would say that we, at this point we still don't have a very good idea of what's the exact temperature that we use each time. Uh, as of now, we actually still rely on visual inspection. So every time when we see one of the dim light coming out from the heater, uh, from experience, that's roughly when uh, the, the temperature uh, is sufficient for growth. Um, the flow, uh, so we use uh, acetylene C2H2 uh, mixing with argon, so the argon is just uh, as a, to, to maintain a constant pressure once when we introduce C2H2. Um, and the electric field we use is around 0 0.6 to 1 volt per micron. The gap between uh, the, sub, uh, the structures are uh, typically designed to be 5 to 10 micron, and we use a catalyst of nickel ion. So uh, we also try uh, uh, playing around with the, the, the shape of the heater. So as you can see here, that um, it sort of gives us a you know better uh, positioning of the carbon nanotube. So instead of having carbon nanotubes going through across here, uh, you can barely see it, but there's actually a carbon nanotube across here. So uh, this gives us a better control of where the carbon nanotube end up to be. So <coughs> some initial observations: um, the carbon nanotube, the carbon nanotubes that we grow are. are uh, are pretty thick, they are around 50 nanometer thick, um, the diameter, and the length varies between 5 to 10 micron. Uh, the growth rate was, is about 3 micron per minute, and if you can see over here, uh, over here we have around 4 connection, over here 3 connection, over 2 connection. So another indication that actually the electric field plays a big part in terms of a successful connection. Because uh, uh, imagine we are actually applying a positive bias over here to heat up this guy, so over here actually we have a much higher electric field compared to here. Um, we also have uh, uh, quite a lot of these guys, these really crooked, not straight ones, and according to, and, and this also widely reported in other literature, so uh, according to one of the paper that I read, uh, it's because of, this is due to the, um, the interaction between the elasticity of the carbon nanotube along its, its length as well as the interaction between the, the interlayers. So, so this only happens for uh, multi-warp. And so and the, and, uh, the uh, simulation result is 34 degrees uh, uh, and this is roughly what we get. Um, another big problem that we have, uh, actually until this day we're still having a lot of problem with it, is the burnout C CNT. So uh, a lot of times when we start growing the carbon nanotube, uh, when we have a connection we, do, we will expect a readout on the 4 meter. Uh, but sometimes when we didn't read out anything and then when we go to go back and do some SCM, uh, we obviously have a connection. So probably this CNT burn out immediately upon connection. Uh, sometimes we actually get a get a voltage read out and we do actually get an IV measurement, good IV measurement, and when we do the SCM it breaks. Sometime after SCM it's okay, but after the second SCM it breaks. So I think there's a lot of electric discharge uh, that's going on here that we that uh, that I think that should be eventually be able to uh, systematically eradicate. But right as of right now, we're still plagued by this problem. Uh, we also play around with the fabrica uh, fabrication condition. So uh, when we increase the gas flow and when we increase the temperature, uh, so once again, I don't have a very good idea of how high exactly it is, but uh, usually typically we raise around 0 0.5 to 1 volt more than the initial uh, the initial growth condition. 
and you can see that the CND, uh, and, and the growth rate actually increased by quite a lot, uh, about more than 10 times. So uh, typically this, uh, this CNT connection, uh, are, uh, they are connected within uh, in less than 10 seconds. And also you can see that the morphology of the CNT are quite different from the ones that we see in the earlier slides. Uh, this is very straight and this is uh, quite thin, uh, much thinner than you can actually compare them here. So what we think is happening here is that probably we have a connection within the first 10 seconds and probably some current flow through this guy and there will be, which means less current flowing through the main heater which will decrease the temperature and hence the temperature is lower now and this thicker carburetor starts coming up. So clearly there are two regimes of growth that we are achieving here. Um, we also observe, uh, we can also observe two different kind of, sorry, two different kind of uh, growth mechanism. So for CVD, typically we have a base and tip growth mechanism whereby um, the precursor, uh, the carbon atom from the precursor gas will sort of uh, be being absorbed into the catalyst. And once the catalyst is uh, fully saturated with carbon atoms, your carbon atom will start growing up. Um, and um, you can have both cases uh, when the where the catalyst is still attached to the substrate or where the catalyst is sort of pushed out at the tip. So these are TM uh, images taken. You can see that uh, this catalyst is at the base and this catalyst is at the tip. So how do we know for sure that we? Uh, well, I, I think we have pretty strong evidence that we have both kind. Uh, as you can see, this is a secondary structure. Uh, the secondary side, the other side, which is uh, not heated, so it should be room temperature. And you can see that uh, upon connection, the carbon nanotubes actually keeps growing. Uh, that's a pretty clear indication that uh, the, the catalyst is still at the, at the, at the heater side because in order for uh, carbon nanotubes to keep on growing, you need the temperature. So that's a pretty clear evidence this is base growth. Uh, versus this one, you can see that it's uh, almost Im immediately stopped. So and that's where we think that it's actually keep growth. Uh, another indication is also you can see that uh, uh, the, the base growth one tend to be a lot smoother versus that of tip growth. So uh, a possible explanation is that um, as the catalyst is further away from the heat source, there's a temperature drop across the carbon nanotube and hence there might be more defects uh, during the growth process. And this, is, this slide is basically talks about uh, how I think one of, uh, one of the benefits of our system, which is institute control growth. So like I mentioned before, we have this uh, mechanism where we have a four meter which read out uh, every time we make a connection over here. So this is a real time uh, monitoring uh, where you can see it clearly that after around seven seconds we make a connection. Right? Uh, the four meter drops from zero to one and five. Of, uh, another example here, uh, the first carbon atom connection after 20 seconds and then another one in 50 seconds. So basically something like this, uh, what, what it can do is that if we can effectively uh, stop the growth process either by uh, stopping the, the heater immediately and also by limiting the, 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 uh, the, flow, uh, the flow of acetylene, we can basically sort of control the successful carbon nanotube connection. Now this is very important when we want to, uh, as you'll see later, when we want to actually have only single CNT connection for characterization of our device. Uh, so before I talk about the IV characteristics, I just want to go over some, some of the, actually many of the factors that can uh, contribute to different uh, measurements. So at the contact level, uh, in terms of contact, um, the number of concentric layers that are in contact with the electrode matters a lot. Uh, there are a lot of dispute about whether uh, actually most of the current actually uh, go through the, the outer layer. Um, but there are also some papers that suggest that in, inner layer also contribute a significant amount. Uh, the contact area and the contact geometry is also a big factor. Um, so typically, most of the literature that I see right now is that they they, uh, they put down carbon nanotube on the substrate and they define the contact with uh, even lithography. So typically, what that means is that it's a side contact, right? So and which also means that there's a big, much bigger contact area uh, compared to what we're getting, because what we're getting is mostly just heat. <laughs> 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 yeah. So and uh, and also electro material use uh, the you know, depending on your work functions. Uh, and the interface coupling, uh, this is uh, one, one thing that is really affecting the stability of our measurements. So uh, there are studies that where uh, researchers actually use the E-beam to uh, sort of create defects at the contact and they get a much more stable readout from it. So that's where the contact, uh, some of the factors that might affect your contact. Uh, CNT, uh, like I said before, each CNT might be very different even though you grow them under the same uh, condition. Uh, and uh, the CNT can be both semiconducting and metallic, so you need, a, you need to make, a, make an intelligent guess of what it is. 
really and there's a dispute about outer layer and inner layer which one contribute more and defect density also plays a part. So what it all comes down to is that there's a very wide range of reported value and these are all single wall, uh, sorry, uh, single carbon dynamic tube connect. Uh, this is not bundle. So I think 34 ohms is a bit uh, too much. Um, only one paper has uh, roughly this kind of value. So if, if it's 34 ohms, you're looking at around 10 to the power of 11 uh, ampere uh, um, per, per cm squared. So very, very high current capacity. Um, most of the values that I find are usually in the um, tens of kilo ohms to 100 of kilo ohm level. The one that we have in our, that in our process are typically around 100 of kilo ohms. So uh, this is our, one of the IP curve that we got. Uh, so over here we have nine uh, successful carbon atom connection. As you can see, it's very ohmic. Uh, we and it's repeatable response, and we get around uh, uh, 480 kilo ohms total. Uh, unfortunately, our device are always not that stable. So this is what I mean by the interface coupling. You can you see that um, this is done under the same condition, but uh, every time we do the same thing, it, it just gives uh, all sorts of uh, very very unstable uh, IV characteristics. And when we go back to do some SCM, okay, you can barely see it, but actually we, we, we find out that the carbon nanotubes are broken. And then when we go back again, uh, it seems that we still have connection, but uh, we, we see a 100 times reduction in the conductivity, although it's, uh, it's a little bit more stable. Um, another device, something like this, um, slightly, so the CNT you see here, uh, okay, can you guys see? Uh, very, th these are the tiny, tiny ones, right? So uh, this, is, this device we have, a pretty good uh, overall uh, resistance, seven, just 7 kilo ohms, but we have uh, more than 10 common nanotubes. And we did uh, did a lot of uh, repeated IV measurements, as, and as you can see, it's just all over the place again. And we did this for around 20 times, and then suddenly we just lost all connections. So we thought it was uh, maybe we broke something. And then when we go back to SCM, uh, we found out that some of the carbon nanotubes are broken, while uh, some of them are still connected. So what this means is that, um, when we have multiple connection, even when it's in the under the same uh, fabrication conditions, uh, different carbon nanotubes, even though they might look different, they are sort of under the same growth condition. They actually do very very different things. So, so what to do? So basically, we we want to just have one single one. So uh, once we once we have sort of uh, fine tuned our process so that we can consistently get a single carbon nanotube uh, connection, we start doing IV measurements again. Uh, this is one of them. And this is not very stable, so we try another one. Uh, so we get something like this, which is fairly stable and very ohmic. So the way we initially try to explain the, the, the ohmic behavior is as such. So the assumption is that uh, our multi-wall carbon nanotubes are metallic. Um, so I think most of the paper nowadays, uh, when they say when they refer to multi-wall, they probably think of it as metallic. Even if it's semiconducting. Uh, as we know, the band gap is uh, inversely direction, uh, sorry, inversely proportional to the diameter. So once you get past around 16 nanometer, your your band gap will be much smaller than basically your thermal uh, normal room temperature will be able to give you some kind of conduction. So ours is around 50 nanometer. So we probably think we think that it's a pretty good assumption. Uh, so this value is taken from uh, another paper that that uh, that's the rough uh, work function for uh, metallic carbon nanotube. And on the silicon side, we have remember we have a very highly doped. And so what we what we have is uh, what we think is going on is actually we have a tunneling um, through through this uh, very thin uh, depletion layer. So that's around a depletion layer, uh, and after some assumption about the contact area, uh, and I guess uh, at least the electrical engineer should know this. Uh, with high doping, your your contact resistance at the at the metal to semiconductor junction uh, decreases uh, exponentially, and so. Uh, according to our calculation, our, the contact resistance that we should see is around somewhere between 0 0.5 and 5 mega ohms, and this is in relation to the overall resistance that we got for that device, which is around 2.5 mega ohms. So this doesn't really tell us a lot because what we really want to know is uh, how much does the contact resistance uh, really contribute to the overall resistance. So. Uh, what about native oxide? So if we have native oxide, and we probably probably have. Uh, the native oxide usually are ten, around 10 amstrom thickness and with a breakdown field of around 3 times 10 to the power of 7 for, for cm. And given the fact that during the growth, uh, we typically apply around 5 volts here and at least 7 volts here. So in the middle, we are looking at uh, somewhere around 10 to 12 volts, right? And so at, at the instance where the carbon to connect to the secondary structure, uh, what we suspect initially was that uh, it's, well, it's definitely going to be, we, we're going to have a few uh, that's much bigger than the breakdown field. So we thought that the, probably the, uh, the, 
the native oxide, if it were there, uh, it, it's probably broken down, and that explains why uh, we, we observe uh, a, quite a lot of ohmic response in our, in our device. But what about the not so ohmic ones? So uh, this, is, this is the SCM image, and this is the IV characteristics. And so with the non-ohmic ones, our observation is uh, typically the current level, or rather the, condu uh, the conductance of the overall system is, is quite a bit lower than the ohmic ones. Uh, so the, that's the first observation, and also we, we don't usually see some kind of turn-on voltage, or like, and uh, and we don't really see an exponential growth of, uh, of of current. So even if we extend this, this is going to be quite linear. So um, that's when we revisit the idea that maybe the native oxide is there. So these are graphs. Um, I, I mean, the, the I guess the device guys have already done a lot of work for uh, for dielectric leakage uh, leakage current through the oxide. So what they found out is basically at very low, uh, at the lower range of low bias, um, your leakage current ex uh, increases exponentially. Uh, of course, you have a thickness dependence over here. So the, the, the thinner your di uh, dielectric, the, the more current it goes through. But there's also this exponential increase in uh, in the leakage current. So what we suspect is that what's really going on at the contact is that uh, we. We're sort of limited by two phenomena. The first phenomena is basically the, the tunneling through the, the thin depletion layer that we had originally, and then the second one is the leakage current through the oxide. So we think that at, at low bias, less than 0 0.25 volt, we are limited by this tunneling current through the native oxide. But once we get past around three, uh, 0 0.3 volt, uh, basically we're limited by by this current that's coming uh, through the through this uh, 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 through this depletion layer. Uh, which is which explains why we probably have a, a little bit more linear characteristics beyond at, uh, at a high bias. And so we we only thought about native oxide very recently. So we, we did this um, as you can see uh, we apply a voltage from zero to ten. Um, the previous graph that you've seen oxide are only from exactly one to one because we don't want to burn up the carbon nanotubes. But we did this this time because we want to really see whether there's an oxide. So I think this is a very clear evidence that we do have some, some stuff at the, at the contact. Uh, as you can see, there's a breakdown voltage over here. If you do some reverse engineering, uh, this will give you around 20 Armstrong, a little bit high, um, but I think that's still reasonable. And if you uh, extrapolate this, uh, take this gradient, this will give you around 270 kilo ohms, which is sort of in line with some, uh, most of our, our, our device where we actually observe only contact. So I think we took a long time to realize that maybe native oxide does better in this case. And so we also did some work to try to, uh, to, to go around this issue of native oxide by replacing the other side uh, with gold. So basically you, we just, we brute force, take away the heater, and uh, Takeshi with his uh, manual skill, he used the wire bonding from the, uh, the machine to put down the gold electrode, and we do the normal process, and as you can see, uh, there is some carbon nanotube connection between the two. So the reason why we want to do this is that we know that the contact between gold and uh, carbon nanotubes, uh, according to a lot of different literature, um, they are supposed to be uh, pretty low uh, contact resistance, and also it should be very ohmic. So if indeed our system is uh, our original system was limited by the contact resistance, we should see quite a uh, quite a big jump in terms of uh, conductivity. Uh, unfortunately, that's not what we observe. Um, we, in fact, we, we have something that's, uh, that's, uh, that looks like this, and it's not only and it's very, very low uh, current level. And this is a uh, 10 to the negative 10. So uh, we don't know how to explain this, so we uh, just chunk this aside for a while. And then three months later, we decided, okay, maybe we should do an IV measurement just to check. And surprisingly, we got this. So this break curve is actually the, the same curve. And when we do it again, and this is sort of the result that we, we, we were expecting, right? at least our own behavior. Um, we don't really have a good idea of why this is so yet. Um, maybe it's because of exposure, prolonged exposure to oxygen. As we know, oxygen has a has a has a big impact on the, uh, the characteristics. But you know, this is at room temperature, so probably more studies will need to be done. But at least we are getting something that's ohmic. And uh, unfortunately, the overall uh, resistance of the system it is it's not a big jump. So uh, it's not it's not what we uh, were sort of looking for. So right now, as of now, we still can't save. For sure, for certainty, with certainty, whether the contact resistance really dominates the whole system. That's what we sort of guess, but we don't have a very convincing evidence yet. Um, so let me move on to some pressure sensing uh, capability uh, that we've tried out with our, with our, with our carbon nanotube. 
So uh, this is a common analytic that have a very omic uh, response, as you can see here. And as we step through the pressure from around uh, the atmospheric pressure, and we bring it down to around 40 torr, uh, you can see that there's a repeatable uh, drop in terms of resistance, right? And and even a sharper jump, uh, sharper decrease uh, once you get past around 400 torr. So you know, we try to do some real-time uh, measurement. So as we cycle through the pressure here, you can see that uh, the output voltage over here, uh, which, which is basically a reflection of the change in the resistance uh, of the carbon nanotube, uh, follows quite well. Um, the reason why it jumps up here is because the, the, the sensitivity, well, well, where, I mean, remember the curvature sound was like this, going down only, uh, it's only very sensitive upon uh, when, it, when the pressure is lower than 400 torr, which is around this range. So that's why we have this sudden jump over here. But this actually correlates very well to our IP measurements. So what we think is going on is that uh, we, 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 when we pass current through the, uh, the carbon nanotube, we are essentially heating it up. And there are other literature that also support that. And uh, uh, probably they, they can go up to our, at least 1200K Kelvin. So what's, what is happening as, as we, uh, as we uh, vacuum the, the system is that there's probably uh, less heat loss through convection. And probably that would mean a, high, a higher temperature, and hence that would have an impact on the overall resistance. Uh, Marcel has done more work on it, but I'm not going to talk about it now. Um, we have, we've also tried uh, to, I guess going back to the contact issue, is that we also try to do some, con some kind of contact annealing to really find out whether our contact actually contributes a lot. Uh, as you can see here, oh, we, we thought that since we already have a in-chip uh, on chip heater, we will just use it and heat it on one side. Uh, you can see that the, the, the catalyst all diffuse into the silicon. Uh, unfortunately, everything breaks and they break in a very interesting manner. You can see a lot of fragments of CNT that's deposited in the gap. Um, and uh, we don't know why is that so. So, probably, um, we, probably uh, when we did this, we probably are using too high a temperature or too high a current. So we we did we try another thing we try to put actually uh, the whole device into furnace uh, we did that for at uh, at around 500 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes as you can see uh, before and after things look the same but um, instead of uh, an increase in, in the conductivity actually uh, almost become not uh, open so uh, I think I think as of now uh, I wouldn't say that um, contact annealing you know is a no go I think it's just that we, we haven't done enough. To, to explore, I guess, different uh, different actual parameters to play with in order to improve the contact a little But I think this is eventually, this should still give us some improvement on the, on the productivity. Um, so finally, I want to talk about um, our attempts to make a uh, CNT-based probe electro. So uh, my professors in Michigan and I guess my colleague Takeshi are experts in this. So uh, people have been trying to use uh, manned space uh, electro to, to probe uh, cells, right, or neurons. So, uh, and you can see that if, or if you can put your electrode inside, in, uh, inside a cell, um, you get around 100 millivolt versus that outside the cell, you get 100 microvolt. So this is a very good motivation for people to actually get your cell, uh, get your probe to be smaller to be inserted in the cell. So very good for carbon energy. Um, there are, of course, there's also patch cell, uh, patch clamp, uh, a very different application. Uh, they, uh, they measure the internal potential through uh, the ion channel. Uh, one thing to note is that they are called giga ohm seal. So if we were to do impedance measurement, this would be uh, uh, roughly a giga ohm would be something uh, of a reference if we want to do the impedance measurement. So the idea is very simple. Uh, since we are carbon nanotube, uh, we just try to pick a some kind of insulator around it, and hopefully we can make a probe out of it. So um, the initial fabrication process is very similar. Uh, we have two uh, opposing structure. We heat up one side, throw the carbon nanotube, gets it connected. And then we use perylene, uh, we deposit perylene as the insulating layer. Now, perylene C, uh, is, 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 uh, pre, they have a pretty high volume resistivity, uh, it's biocompatible. And the best thing is that it's, it has high conformal uh, deposition. So even down to 50 nanometers. So this is a TM image, and uh, you guys see the CNT in the video, but the point is that we actually have 50 nanometer uh, of uh, perylene, and you can see that, that it's, it's fairly even. Uh, but I guess once you get down to below 50 nanometer, uh, corpo starts appearing. Uh, and also it has a you know, fairly low melting temperature. So upon uh, depositing the perylene C, what we do is we heat up the other side. So what this is going to do is uh, it will melt off the perylene on, on, on this side of the heater and it's also going to expose 
part of the pairing at the tip. And at the same time, uh, probably through thermal shock or, or, or some other reasons, uh, but you always uh, detach, the common nanotubes will always detach at this point. So what you end up having is something like this. So uh, you have a common nanotube connection, you deposit parallel and then you hit this guy up. And sure enough, it detached, and you can see this carbon nanotube hanging up with paralleling around it. And this is probably the, I guess, the best picture you're going to see all day. Um, so you can see very clearly you have a carbon nanotube sticking out with, with the paralleling wrap around it. So the goal is to have this part inserted into a cell. That's the angle. Um, so in order for us to prove whether the, the device is workable as an electro, uh, as, a, as a probe, uh, we try to do a lot of impedance measurement. So initially what we did was that we, we put a um, um, saline solution, we just drop a saline droplet onto the chip and uh, use a reference electrode outside and, and uh, try to read our signal that way. But we, we had a lot, lot of problems with that. So firstly, the droplets are usually too big and we have some problem with micro bubbles. So we don't know whether the, the saline solution actually wraps around the whole device. So that's not good because your capacitance is going to be affected by the area that you are, you are, uh, that is covered by the setting solution. So we went the other route. Uh, it's a rather long route. So what we did was, uh, uh, so Takeshi uh, designed this layout. And so what we have is uh, this uh, protruding silicon support. And we put a heater at the end. And, we, it's, uh, and then we, we, we split up the package as such. And you can see actually this is protruding. So we do a normal growth on, on this heater, and as you can see, there's some carbon to going through. And what this is going what this is going to bring us is that we have active control of the positioning of the carbon nanotubes right now. So we can potentially, uh, you can see that this is the saline solution, and we we basically have a much better control of the position of where the carbon nanotube and where the saline solution is. And the angle was to uh, have this uh, carbon nanotubes touch this and read out some kind of impedance measurement. Uh, unfortunately, as of now, we still don't have any conclusive um, conclusive uh, evidence yet. Um, but I think this is much better than the, our original method. So we also try um, uh, some interface with uh, real cells. Uh, we choose onion cell uh, mainly because it's readily available. It, uh, it doesn't require a liquid medium to survive. Uh, we did it the brute force way. We sort of force a onion cell to be. Uh, to be on uh, on the cell, and these are all done uh, manually. So, uh, and we go through a normal uh, heating process. So you can see some carbon nanotubes that are grown here, and this this cell is actually hanging above above the heater. So you can see that we we just get some connection. Uh, carbon nanotubes attaching to the cell. Uh, what we really wanted to get out of this was we really want to see at this point what's going on at the interface. But I think this process is probably not going to work because. Um, just by putting on the cell onto the chip, uh, the process of it, uh, as you can see, the cells are broken. So I think we probably need to refer back to the, uh, using the, the uh, extruding silicon support for better control. And instead of having the setting solution, have a cell over there and do that. Um, so so that, that's all that I have today. Um, so basically, uh, I've outlined how we've sort of fine-tuned the localized growth of carbon nanotube using our process. Um, I've highlighted the in-situ monitoring and uh, our ability to control the number of uh, carbon nanotube connection. Uh, I've talked about briefly on the electrical properties of our system and also go through the pressure sensing and our attempts at making the cell electrical. So, uh, and these are the, some publications and uh, we have another one uh, that's not listed here. We don't know whether it's published yet. And finally, the last one is not related to this work. Uh, so, and I'd like to thank Professor Lin and Professor King for, for, for letting me do my work under them. Uh, I really enjoy the intellectual freedom that, uh, that I have under both of you. Um, and Takeshi Kawano for being a, being a great mentor, a great friend, uh, and being always very optimistic about the result. <laughs> I'm usually the more critical one. And, so, and also Brian, Charlie, Leilor, Ethan, Takashi, and Marcel. So all of you have helped in my project somewhere or other, so I want to thank you guys. And of course, yeah, my other lab mates for some, a lot of insightful discussion and the EML folks for teaching me how to do, uh, use the equipment, TM, SEM, and also to Tammy and my family for the support. And I'm open for questions right now. Thank you.
do things pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so did you, did you do a lot of process optimization for the, the um, growth, just to, yeah. to, to maximize the number of, uh, I guess, multi-wall carbon nanotubes, metallic uh, mm -hmm. tubes? So I think uh, we definitely have done a lot. I mean, for us to grow carbon nanotubes is actually very easy. Uh, the problem right now is that the yield is still pretty bad. Uh, like I said, we still have a lot of burnout uh, situation. Uh, we, we take a lot of precaution, like we even like, ground ourselves when we touch the package and you know, do, like we really take a lot of precaution, but we still have this problem. Um, so, and also sometimes I guess our, 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 our device are not that, I mean they're heated themselves. Uh, even though I say that they are 350 ohms, uh, but sometimes uh, they, they, they can vary quite a lot. So yeah, when, why is that? Because they're silicon. Right? So I, I think, silicon. yeah, I think for so we, we have actually two kinds of samples. Uh, some well, some of the samples we actually etch a back hole for, for uh, actually be, below the heaters we have a back etch a back hole, uh, and that's for taking TM images. Uh, so I think for that process, uh, those heaters tend to be much higher resistance, uh, maybe in the kilo ohms range. And we think that maybe the, uh, maybe during the process we have some uh, polymer residue that still. PR residue that's still on on the heater, so that means basically when we make the connection um, at the contact, that's where the, the resistance come from. Um, with those, are, because the, are you still looking at the heaters driven directly by? Are you bonding directly to or is it metal? There must be some metal contact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so through the package, we have wire bonding to the contact and then call contact link. So, are you making good contact with the silicon? I think the contacts are pretty good. So. Um, but you know, we, sometimes we still have very high, I mean pretty high resistance. The thing with higher resistant uh, heater is that we, we basically need high voltage to, to heat it up. And with higher voltage, the tendency to, to break the carbon nanotubes increase a lot. So we typically only get a uh, really successful connection when it's around 100 ohms range. The, yeah. the, heat, the heater? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the heater. Yeah. Okay. And and as you can see, we, we, we are getting basically two very different kinds of carbon nanotubes, right? We have those very, very straight ones that are always connected within 10 seconds. So, and, and we also have those that are very, very thick ones. I mean, the 50 nanometer that are very curly, they can just go all over the place. So, I think we, we, have, we have a pretty good idea. I mean, one, one of the main limitations that we have with our, with our uh, with our method is that we don't have a very good idea of what exactly is the temperature, right? So uh, it's, 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 it's basically my eye, by, by visual inspection. So that's, that's not a very good way to tell at all, actually. But by color or something? Yeah, actually, really, uh, just by color. I mean, I, I've, I've done it enough times to sort of have a gut feel, but you know, it's, it's not good enough. So and I, think that, I think probably in the next run, uh, I think what my colleagues are going to do, they are going to probably have uh, some uh, I think Brian has some pain, uh, pain that, that they, he knows a uh, specific melting temperature. So you can sort of correlate that with, uh, and do a calibration that way, but it's still not going to be exact, actually. Yeah. I think temperature is a, is a big factor, definitely. So I, what, are the, what is the ideal property of the nanotubes that you want for, for these applications? But I, I think the, uh -huh. well, I think it's it's not it's not really I guess how should I put it? Um I guess for, for nicer pictures I want the straight ones. So, <laughs> so at least you want straight ones, okay. Right, I mean I, I, I want so the straight you ones but optimize the process to get more straight ones versus the cold yeah, so straight ones I know I know when I can get them. I just when I heat it up a lot more, I, I usually get the straight ones. So so that's very, very consistent. Uh, but whether they break it's another matter. <laughs> so and also, um, I guess for for pressure sensing, we we, we already I think that's uh, that's we, we are gonna make we have some progress on that. So I think and uh, Marcel has done more work. So what we have initially with our chamber was we can only pump it down to around forty toll. So they have taken it into the SEM and actually uh, pump it down to like kind of negative something uh, toll. So so and I think that we have more results. In Another paper. Um, so I think the pressure sensing is is, is it, that's easy to do. But I think the most promising one is actually the separate. Um, I do think that it's 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 uh, it's it's the next thing to do, right? I mean, you you can't really get your silicon based uh, electrode to be that small. 
right? So I think what we have is we've already proved that we can make this pro. I mean, what you want is that it's a, it's a team to be exposed, right? So the next thing is to actually get impedance measurement and to prove that you can actually put this thing into, into a cell. So your your nanotubes are tens of nanometers in diameter. Yep. So silicon, you can make silicon nanowires that small, but you're you're probably going to need stronger, something stronger. Is that, is that the benefit of the nanotubes? Okay. So <laughs> uh, okay, I'm not aware that we we can make 10, 10 nanometers. Is it of silicon? Uh, I don't know. I, I guess for, for for the papers that actually use silicon based uh, uh, electrodes, those are you know at least I don't know, hundred nanometers or actually micro. Maybe they are just not strong enough. I mean, and, and I'm not saying that uh, carbon nanotubes are going to be strong. Of course, I mean they are they are like a string, right? So that's that's we're gonna have to do a lot more, I guess, mechanical uh, robustness to see whether it, you can actually pop something into it. Uh, something that we thought about is that we can we can do a um, during growth kind of process. So like you can have the cell, and you, we can have instead of have, have a carbon nanotube that's already grown, we have the carbon nanotube growing. And during that period, because it has heat, right? So perhaps that heat is can can help you go inside the cell without hurting the cell, of course. Because I mean it's high temperature, but it's very low dissipation. It's actually very low heat. Reliability. You showed that with each measurement, the, the changes, the resistance changes. Oh yeah. So so does, does that depend on what voltage you apply? I mean, if you if you limit it to like micro volts, I mean, do you still see that changing with each sweep? Oh, I think. What range voltage? Oh, you mean the the volt the volt? Uh, we've never tried micro volt. Usually, you just sweep from like one to one. Um, but I think so. Most of the for not stable ones are tend to be the the the. Not, not only once, and uh, I think that now recently that we found out maybe native oxide, uh, we can't uh, just distribute, uh, ignore uh, native oxide. Probably what we're going to do is to every time we, we have those kind of uh, response, we just pump it up, right? To try to burn as much, we, hopefully without burning the carbon nanotubes, because it, it seems that from from just that sample alone, we, it seems that uh, once we've done that, it's uh, it's only so we we did. We did break down the carbon, uh, the oxide. So once it's all like the you don't see this. Yeah, we so change. so what happened was after, after ten volts, so you, we we see only right. So I try to do it again. So initially I saw only response, but then I break it immediately because I started from negative ten. Okay. Right, but I know I know that it, it's it's only at that point. Yeah. I guess that's one of the reason why we also want to do contact annealing because we want to get rid of the instability. Most probably is because of it's the inter the interface contact. coupling, right? So if if because right now our, our our contact is really not much of a contact. I mean, it's room temperature on the other side. Uh, it's most likely just going to be vulnerable forces, right? And and um, and probably the only the the, the current that, that are going through are by tunneling. So tunneling are very EGVG, right? And it really depends on how strong the vulnerable forces. So if there's some way that we can sort of have some have a high temperature, or you know, chemically, you know, if even you know, even by creating defects, as you know, some other researchers have done by EB or something like that to improve the contact. Uh, I think it's gonna solve the. Because I mean, what we really want is just stability. I think the the the, the resistance level that we're getting, I think I, I think it's okay. Because bear in mind that we are we're having tip, most of the the, the other uh, publications are all side contact, so there is it's really comparing like for an origin way. What's your gut feeling by uh, coming to two, ten to break? I think it's electric discharge. Discharge? Yeah. Uh, so what we, we, we uh, a while ago, uh, <laughs> during, we, we take SEM. So right now we have the ability to actually uh, apply, we, we, we do uh, apply IV, uh, apply voltage while in SEM. And so recently when Master was doing it and I was there, and uh, when he just, actually he, he wasn't, I mean the, the, the sample is inside the SEM, right? He was just touching the wire, external wire, and you can see the carbon atom moving. You know, the, the moving actual carbon atom actuator. So just by touching it, it, it moves a lot. So I I don't know whether that's a good indication, but 
certainly with just a bit of, uh, just a bit of, I don't know, our own charge with can move it. So what we have the, uh, in that sample is we have a free hanging, uh, so sort of only one side is attached. Uh, we were doing some experiment with, the, I guess, uh, um, moving it by, by electric force. Uh, so we, at that time we were, they were, they were using just applying electric field, right? But what he did was he just touched it, <laughs> you can still come around to move it. I don't know whether that's a clear evidence that you know that electric is charged, but I mean it's certainly. We asked why they break during growth. I think it, it doesn't only break during growth; it breaks uh, any time it wants. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the main part. I mean we. I think most of the time we we can well, I shouldn't say most of the time, but we, we can get connection. It's just that whether it breaks. I would say that we get connection around eighty percent of the time, seventy percent, eighty percent of the time. And then it will break at some point uh, so that that will that will limit it down to forty percent. But I think it's it's still Okay, I, I can't really compare to, to the rest, uh, the other methods, um, but I would say that this method of connection is much easier than a lot of the other. I mean, if you if you take CIT uh, from say uh, that, that you buy, right? I mean, you basically need to hire a graduate student to pick up one by one. This is something that you I can do. I can I can do like I mean, a few dozens in a day if I want to, and just keep trying. Actually, you won't ask the question. Hi. Uh, yeah, good talk. So, so <laughs> okay. speak on the, uh, the pressure sensor. The, I think the, uh, recently one research reported the uh, temperature of nanotube. So, from Sandia National Laboratory. So, they measure the temperature in the TEM. So, they estimated the temperature uh, is about 2000 Kelvin. When they apply uh, 1.5 volt and the current is 20 microampere or something. So, I think the order is the same as your device, right? So, I think the temperature of nanotube is uh, pretty high. <laughs> so, I think the temperature. How, how did they do the measurement for the TEM? They, they put the uh, magnetic oxide particle or oh, particle. Okay. So, they so made something it like what you have a group theory, put gold particles? Uh, yeah. Okay. Something like that. Yeah. I think the temperature is critical for the pressure sensor. Mm -hmm. I guess. <laughs> Okay, thank you.